very much. Uh, tonight I want to, to talk to you about what my idea of nature's best hope is, but before I do that, I want to talk about E.O. Wilson's uh, book that he wrote in 2016. Of course, many of you probably know he died the day after Christmas, so we've lost a, a great conservation leader, one of the greatest. But this is the book he wrote in, in 2016 uh, called Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life. And that has been a theme throughout most of his very long career was to try to save life on planet Earth. He put it all together in this book and said, uh, you know, in order to save life anywhere on the planet, we're going to have to save room for nature on at least half of the planet. We need functional ecosystems on at least half of the planet. And he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that statement. And then he ended the book. He didn't spend a lot of time talking about how we were actually going to get there. Uh, so, you know, conservationists love the idea. Well, let's just put half the planet aside. But uh, we also know that half of the planet is, is in some form of agriculture right now. We've got, um, you know, almost 8 billion people and all of our detritus in the other half. And there isn't a third half to, to put aside. So a lot of people are wondering how could, how could we actually do this? Well, I think we can do it. I think we can realize uh, E.O. Wilson's dream, but we're going to need a new approach to conservation in order to do it. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. Back in 2019, we had what we call an oak mast, where members of the red oak group got together and all decided to make their acorns at the same time. And that's what it looked like in a lot of places. I'm easily entertained. So I took one of those acorns and I just stared at it. And I was rewarded because an insect started to chew its way out of the acorn, first it chewed a little hole for its head, force its head through there. Then it forces its entire body through that little hole. It was a tight squeeze, kind of looked like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Finally, it plopped down. And that's a very dangerous time for this insect larva because there are a lot of things that, that want to eat it. So it gets to safety by wiggling and squirming beneath the soil surface in about 30 seconds. And once it's under underground, it stretches in all directions and forms a chamber. And within that chamber converts itself to a pupa. And then it stays there for two years as a pupa. After two years comes out as an acorn weevil. That's what an acorn weevil looks like. A lot of people think weevils have big noses because it looks like they do, but that's actually an extension of the head capsule. And the mouth parts are way down here at the end of that extension. They take those mouth parts and they chew a hole into the center of the acorn, turn around, lay an egg in it, and that's how the larva gets down there. Now you might wonder why they spend two years underground. Uh, why don't they come out the next year the way uh, most insects would? And the answer is it takes red oak acorns 18 months to complete their their development. So if they come out the very next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for them. Of course, once they leave the acorn, that leaves a hole, a true vacuum. And you know that nature, nature abhors a vacuum. In this case, she has filled it with three species of temnothorax ants, tiny little ants, where the entire colony lives in the holes made by acorn weevils in acorns. And if scouts find a new acorn, uh, that is empty, they get all excited because their old acorns falling apart. So they tell everybody it's time to move the old colony. They grab the larvae, they grab the eggs, they move the entire colony into the new acorn in about 30 minutes. Then they post a guard, make sure nobody else comes in. And that's where they will live for the next two years until this acorn starts to fall apart. What's my point? Well, it's very simple. That is just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions, largely between animals and plants that comprise the bulk of nature. This is another one, the relationship between jays and acorns. Jays are the primary disperser of oak acorns. They'll take an acorn uh, from the, the tree in the fall, and then they'll fly up to a mile from the parent tree, tap it below the surface of the ground. And the object is they're going to go and, and, and have something to eat during the wintertime. But for every three acorns, no, for every four acorns they bury, they only remember where uh, one of them is. So for every four acorns they bury, they're actually planting three new uh, oak trees. Another specialized uh, relationship between pileated woodpeckers and carpenter ants. That's what they rear their young on, carpenter ants. So you won't have pileated woodpeckers unless you have lots of carpenter ants, and you won't have lots of carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena facilia, unless you have facilia. That is the only pollen, the only plant that that bee can use for pollen to reproduce on. It turns out pollen specialization is very common in our, our native bees. We have about 4,000 species of native bees, and over a third of them are very specialized on particular types of pollen. You won't have the Baltimore checker spot unless you have white turtle head. I could talk all night, all week 
all year about nature specialized relationships. My point is though, that these relationships, nature itself is now on the ropes and it's on the ropes because we did not take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, stood on the edge and looked out over its wonderful view. And he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Well, we didn't leave it as, as it was. Uh, there's only about 5% of the lower 48 states. It's anything close to its original pristine ecological state. And that's because we have logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it. We have drained it. We have grazed it. We've got 770 million acres of rangeland, four and a half times the size of Texas dedicated to cows. And of course, we paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them, and you can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We have drained our aquifers. We have introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we've carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated from other remnants to sustain the number of species that we need to run the ecosystems that we all depend on. You might wonder why we've done this. I wonder why we've done this. And I don't know, but I suspect that we thought the earth, our nest was so big, we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. But of course we were wrong about that. And that's why we're seeing uh, headlines like this, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Talking about global insect decline, followed by this one, North America has lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. Almost a third of our North American bird population already gone. Then the UN says, well, we're gonna lose a million species to extinction, probably in the next 20 years. Um, maybe you heard, oh, I don't know, a month, month or two ago, we removed 23 species from the endangered species list, not because we've saved them, but because they're already extinct. So this is happening, but it's not an option. We can't allow it to happen. These are the species that keep us alive on planet earth. We cannot allow these, these things to happen. So I could go on talking about the, the uh, pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment, thus upon all of our houses, but that is not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from lots of people. But those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return briefly to this headline, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Well, E.O. Wilson told us what it would mean if we were to lose insects, and he did it way back in 1987 with this paper, The Little Things That Run the World. And his message was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if insects were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappear, that would so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial habitats that the the food webs that support our animals, the birds, the amphibians, the reptiles, the mammals, even many of our freshwater fish, those food webs would collapse and those animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would, would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients. And all we would have is bacteria and fungi. Of course, humans wouldn't, wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. There is some good news. Uh, and that is that uh, none of this has to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself. And by the way, we need to do that to save ourselves. But we're gonna to have to change the way we, we landscape in order to do it. And we're gonna to have to change the way we landscape pretty soon. Why is that? Well, remember humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on nature, on the, the life support systems that nature produces. We call them ecosystem services. Here are just a few things that, that plants are doing every day that we depend on. They produce oxygen. Obviously we depend on that. Clean water, we depend on that. They're capturing carbon, pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, fixing it in their tissues and then pumping the extra carbon into the ground. Extremely important ecosystem service today. They're building topsoil and holding it in place. They're preventing floods, dampening severe weather, converting sunlight into food. If we lost our, our plants, we'd have to eat sunlight and that will be hard. What do animals do for plants? They provide pest control services. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds. So designing landscapes like this that destroy the production of ecosystem services is just not a good idea. 
never was a good idea, but today it's a terrible idea because we've got so many people on the planet demanding more and more ecosystem services all the time. We have parks, we have preserves, and they are producing some ecosystem services, but they're too small. They're too isolated from each other. And if they were working, we wouldn't be in the sixth grade extinction right now. Now, there have been visionaries through the ages who have recognized that, that we humans needed to work on our relationship with planet Earth. And Aldo Leopold was one of the most eloquent. He wrote extensively in the first half of the 1900s. One of the things he said is that the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. There have been indigenous groups that have been able to do that for long periods, but our huge Western societies and our, our huge Asian societies are terrible at doing that. We habitually take more from the planet than it has to offer, completely wrecking an area, going to another area, doing the same thing, not sustainable behavior. But uh, Leopold had, had a lot of faith in humans. Uh, he, he believed we could develop what he called a land ethic. He knew that we had to use the land. We had to farm and lumber and graze and mine and do all those things. But he believed we could learn to do it gently enough so we did not destroy local ecosystems. That's what he called the land ethic, and he wrote about it in the Sand County Almanac. What he did not write about uh, was developing a land ethic where we actually lived. And I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect that the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist in the same place at the same time, that notion was so deeply embedded in the, the culture of Aldo Leopold's day, still embedded in our own culture, that he may not have recognized it as an option. What I want to argue tonight, though, is that living with nature not only is an option, it is now the only viable option left to us. And in the past, of course, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head. We need to save nature, actually reconstruct it where we've dismantled it, where there are a lot of people, because that's pretty much everywhere. In other words, we have to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes, not hang on by a thread, not get diminished every single year, but thrive. Where are we gonna do that? Well, uh, we have to consider private property because most of the land is privately owned. 85.6% of the US east of the Mississippi is privately owned. 78% of the entire country is privately owned. 95% of Texas is privately owned. If we don't do conservation on private property, we're gonna fail. Um, so let's, let's keep that in mind. And when I talk about conservation, I'm, I'm not talking about conserving things that aren't already wrecked. We certainly want to do that. I'm talking about rebuilding them, actually a form of restoration. It won't look like it used to look, uh, but it still could be a functioning ecosystem if we reunite enough of those very specialized interactions. Uh, and, and again, it won't be the way it, it, it used to be exactly, but it still can produce ecosystem services. We can have some nature around. But in order to do that, we have to start with the most important species. Not all species contribute to ecosystem function equally. So we have to start with the building blocks. And there's two groups uh, of species that we can't do without. One would be the flowering plants and the pollinators that uh, allow them to reproduce. They are capturing the energy from the sun and turning it into food, then storing it in their plant parts, largely leaves. Uh, well, now we if we don't get that energy from plants to animals, we won't have any animals and you won't have functional ecosystems. Most vertebrates do not eat plants directly. Most vertebrates eat invertebrates that ate the plants. Most of those invertebrates are caterpillars. And it turns out the caterpillars are enormously important. They're transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we design landscapes that don't have a lot of caterpillars in them, we have a failed food web and a failed ecosystem. Let's use the Carolina chickadee as an example. That's what we have here down in Southeast Pennsylvania. Uh, north of here, we have, you have the, the uh, black cat chickadee, practically the same bird doing the same thing. And they, of course, are the birds that are feeders in the winter time eating seeds. So we tend to think that's all they need. Well, 50% of their diet in, in the winter is seed, but the other 50% is insects and spiders. And when they reproduce in the spring, their babies can't eat seeds. So they switch entirely to insects. And if they're in a healthy environment, they will rear their young exclusively on caterpillars. And it turns out they are not exceptions. 96% of our terrestrial birds are, are rearing their young on insects. And most of those insects turn out to be caterpillars. How do I know that? Well, there's a number of lines of evidence that suggest that. But this is a citizen science project that one of my uh, recent PhD students uh, has finished, Ashley Kennedy. 
She put out a call to bird photographers around the country to take pictures of birds during the breeding season when they're carrying food to the nest. They're going to send those pictures to Ashley. She's going to identify the prey items that were in the beaks of the birds and reconstruct the nestling diet for as many species of birds in North America as possible. Uh, well, the bird photographers got, got into this. They sent Ashley thousands of pictures. And this is a summary of, of her results. The green bars are the percentage of the nestling diet in each one of these plant families that was caterpillars. And in 16 out of the 20 common bird families that she has enough data for, uh, caterpillars dominated the diet. So again, imagine what would happen to bird reproduction if we took caterpillars out of the, of the environment. Most of our birds would not be able to reproduce. So there's something special about caterpillars. Um, what is it? There's actually several things special about caterpillars. And one of them is pretty obvious, they're soft. Think of this guy as if he's uh, a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. The thin wrapper is, is exoskeleton, it's made of chitin. Uh, it's undigestible, so the birds don't want a lot of that. And because caterpillars are soft, you can stuff them down the throat of your, your offspring without fear of, of injuring them. And if you've ever watched a parent bird rear its young, they're pretty rough. Their beak is like, like a, a plunger. They just stuff that caterpillar down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Some of our, our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? They're nutritious, they're very high in fat, very high in protein, low percentage of chitin of exoskeleton compared to many other insects, particularly beetles, which are not like little sausages, they're like little tanks. So much of a beetle is undigestible and many beetle, beetles have a lot of very sharp edges too. Finally, it turns out the caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now, I mentioned carotenoids not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate and you're a vertebrate. Birds are vertebrates. And we vertebrates uh, cannot, uh, we vertebrates need carotenoids is what I'm trying to say. We don't make our own carotenoids. We have to get them from plants. Only plants make carotenoids. And we have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. So where are the birds getting their carotenoids from? From what they eat, of course. But carotenoid content is not equally distributed among bird prey items. These first two bars here are types of caterpillars. They have far more carotenoids than, than other uh, types of bird prey. Here are the adult caterpillars down here, the moths and butterflies themselves. They have far fewer carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves. That's where the carotenoids are. It's the caterpillars that eat the green leaves. And here is the, the earthworm over here. So the earthworm gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. So that study and several others are suggesting that uh, for birds, at least, caterpillars seem to be, um, they're not optional parts of the diet. They're essential parts of the diet. So let's just say birds need caterpillars. The next question is how many caterpillars do they need? Is one or two enough or one or two a day enough? Well, let's go back to chickadees. A lot of data on chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of chickadees? One or two is not enough. One or two a day is not enough. It takes thousands of caterpillars to get one clutch of chickadees to the point where they leave the nest, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars. And after they need, leave the nest, and that depends on the number of, of chicks in the nest. After they leave the nest, the par parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days. So you're really talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars to get one clutch of chickadee to the point where they are independent when they keep eating caterpillars. And if you want chickadees to breed in your yard, you gotta have all those caterpillars in your yard because they're not flying five miles down the road to find caterpillars. They forage about 50 meters from the nest. And if we landscape in a way that does not produce all those caterpillars, that's called uh, insect decline. And it's really looking like insect decline is directly related to the bird declines that people are measuring. We went to the original data set from Rosenberg et al. That's the group that said we have lost uh, 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And we looked at, we divided the terrestrial birds into two groups, the group of uh, birds that require insects at some part of their life history, typically when they're breeding, and the species that don't require insects. So things like, like finches and doves that can actually reproduce on seeds. They didn't lose any, any uh, numbers at all in the last 50 years, but the birds that require insects lost on average 10 million individuals per species. This doesn't prove cause and effect, but it certainly does suggest that if you take caterpillars away, the birds are not gonna do very well. So we need a, a new goal 
for when we think about, about landscaping. In the past, we've only thought about making pretty landscapes. Whether they had a ecological function was not part of, the, of the, uh, our criteria. Uh, but we can make pretty, pretty landscapes that also produce a lot of caterpillars. So how do we do that? We add caterpillars to landscapes by adding the plants that, that make them, that support them. Seems easy enough. But there is a catch, and that catch is that most plants don't make a lot of caterpillars. So we have to be fussy about which species of plants we're going to put in our yard. And we have to be fussy about it because the caterpillars themselves are fussy. And the monarch butterfly illustrates it perfectly. Monarchs, of course, uh, only eat milkweeds. So you can have all the, all the calorie pear and all of the burning bush and all of the boxwoods and all of the barberries and all of the plants that we typically landscape with from Asia, and you won't make a single monarch butterfly. The only way you're gonna do that is to have, have milkweeds. That's called host plant specialization. It turns out that most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. Why is that? Well, because plants have made them that way. Plants don't wanna be eaten. They wanna capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their tissues, mostly their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a very effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green in the summertime. It's not because there are no insects out there that wanna eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well protected. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those, those chemical defenses? This is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. They can only eat the particular plant lineages for which they have developed adaptations that allow them to get around those defenses. So they develop specialized enzymes that help them store and excrete and detoxify those compounds. Specialized behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that allow them to minimize their exposure to those, those defensive compounds. It takes a long period of evolutionary history for all those adaptations to fall into place. And once they do fall into place, the insect is locked into eating the particular plant lineage. And that's why when we bring in plants from other, other continents to landscape with, and when those plants escape and become invasive species in our natural areas, we're wrecking the food web because most of our insects cannot eat those plants. So all I'm saying here is that plant choice matters. If we're trying to rebuild ecosystem function, we have to choose the plants that are going to support the food webs that create those, those ecosystems. And I'm going to give you uh, a few examples of how well this works when we do choose the right plants. And I'm going to start with, with our house right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. This is what it looked like when we moved in, my wife Cindy and I. Uh, it was part of a farm that was broken up into 10-acre lots. And it had been mowed for hay before we moved in. So there very little, uh, well, just about nothing there when we moved in. So our job was to, to uh, rebuild the Eastern deciduous forest on this little, little patch of land. In order to do that, you've got to bring those caterpillars back. So um, that, that was my goal. Here's some examples. I wanted the Canadian owlet to be reproducing at our house. That's what a Canadian owlet looks like. I'd never even seen a Canadian owlet. That's what the adult looks like, just like a, uh, a leaf. But you don't have Canadian owlets unless you have meadow row. It's a specialist on meadow row. We didn't have any meadow row. The area had been farmed for almost 300 years. All the meadow rows gone from anywhere around here. I don't know where there's any meadow row around here. So I got some seeds from somebody, planted the seeds, they grew very nicely. Um, but, you know, this was early on, and, and uh, I actually had very little faith that Canadian outlets would be able to find my, my little patch of meadow root. Where were they going to come from? Who, who knows? So I didn't even go out and check it for about a month, two months after I planted it. But I walked by accidentally for uh, another reason and noticed that there were Canadian outlets all over my meadow root. They had found it right away. I'm still surprised about that. So now I've got a good population of metaru and a good population of Canadian owlets. So we've added two species to the property. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. This beautiful uh, yellow orange moth. Actually, that's a misnomer. It has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's a specialist on, on this plant, Biden's Aristosa. Ditch daisy. I did know where there was some um, ditch daisy in a power line cut about 14 miles away. So I got some seeds, planted them at home. They grew very nicely. Took a year for the goldenrod stowaway to find my bindings, but it did. And I've got a good population of, of uh, both uh, ditch daisy and the goldenrod stowaway. So now we've added four species to the property. 
Same story with the Hackberry Emperor. Why did the Hackberry Emperor? Not because it's the most beautiful butterfly in the world, but because it belongs here. It's supposed to be here. Well, as its name suggests, it's a specialist on Hackberry, on Celtus, and we didn't have any Celtus. So I planted Celtus. Took four years for the butterflies to find my Celtus, but they did. Checked one of my, my uh, Celtus branches in June. There were nine Hackberry Emperor caterpillars on a single branch. So another big success. Now we've added six species. And that's how it's gone. I did not plant goldenrod, came in on its own. And along with it came many of the things that depend on goldenrod, like the brown hooded owlet, the arcidra flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparaginothus, the goldenrod gall moth. This is one that hasn't come, the goldenrod flower moth. I don't know why it hasn't found our, our goldenrod, but it, but it hasn't. That's what its caterpillars look like. But this can be part of the fun. It's, it's anticipation. It's like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. Every year, I check my goldenrod in the fall looking for this caterpillar. One of these years, I'm going to find it, and that'll be a great day. Planted Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper. Uh, it's a great native plant. Um, I hear people don't like it. I just don't know why they don't like it. It can climb our trees without girdling them, without pulling them down. It's a good ground cover, has great fall color, makes really nutritious berries for the birds in the fall. It's a, it's a um, underappreciated pollinator plant, believe it or not. Its flowers are small and inconspicuous. The reason you know it's in flower is because the bees are all, all over it, big cloud of, of bees. Remember, when you're making a pollinator garden, you're making for the, for the pollinators, not, not for you. But I planted Virginia creeper uh, because it's the best host for the large sphinx moths that are the primary component of cardinal diets, things like the Pandora Sphinx and its beautiful adult, the lettered Sphinx, the hog Sphinx, the Abbott Sphinx are all on Virginia creeper. Wanted to see if I could get the double tooth prominent at our house, just because it's such a cool looking caterpillar. I mean, even if you don't like caterpillars, you gotta like this guy. Well, it's a specialist on elm, uh, particularly American elm. And of course we lost our, our American elms to Dutch elm disease years ago. No, no elms around here. So, but there were two big elm trees at the University of Delaware that did not die. And they produce seed every year. I got some seeds when we moved in uh, and planted them. That was 19 years ago. And those trees are now 80 feet tall. They've done really well. And they attracted the double tooth prominent right away. American elm. One of the evening primrose moth uh, because it's, it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else. Believe it or not, we didn't have any evening primrose, so I planted that. Moth came, spends the day with its head stuffed in the flowers. It's very cute. And I planted lots of oak trees. Uh, now, these are just examples of the plants that I put back on, on our yard. But I want to focus on oaks for a while because they are such important species. This is the Bedford oak in Bedford, New York. Some of you might know it. Uh, people argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. It's enormous. And I hear people say, well, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. And if you can only enjoy an oak when it's 400 years old, you're right, you won't. But if you can enjoy uh, what your oak is contributing to your, your property, you can enjoy it right away. And I can say that with confidence because I planted most of our oaks as acorns, which means they were free, or as two-foot bare root whips, which means they cost $1.50 each. And immediately they started to rebuild the food web, the moth-based food web that supports almost everything else at our house by bringing things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow-shouldered moth, the Zuki's promolactus, the red washed caterpillar, the yellow-vested moth, the orange-tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two-spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red-humped oak worm, the orange-humped oak worm, the pink-striped oak worm, the hesitant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown ducalatrix, the orange patch smoky wing, the white blotched heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laffer, and literally hundreds more species have come to the oaks at our house and they've come right away. This is a pin oak that has just popped its head above the leaves and here's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that, that tree. So you don't have to wait hundreds of years for your oaks to start to rebuild that food web that supports the ecosystem where you live. Oaks will do it almost immediately. This is what our house looks like today, or at least in the summertime. I show you this picture to convince you that we're normal. We have a little bit of lawn here, uh, but I put a lot of plants back. And, and as soon as I started doing that, I realized uh, they were attracting an awful lot of, of life. 
And when I realized that caterpillars are driving the, the ecosystem, uh, particularly the food web function, I wanted to get a picture of every species of caterpillar that is now making a living at our house. And I've been taking pictures of caterpillars and, and their adult moth forms for the last four years, haven't gotten to the butterflies yet, but I am up to 1,140 species of moths now make a living at our house because we put the plants back. Now we have 10 acres. Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. So on one 240 thousandths of the land mass, we've got 44% of all the moths that occur in the entire state. And because so many of these are types of bird food, we've recorded 60 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres. Not flew by, but bred. Why am I telling you this? Well, this is another headline we saw last year that uh, the World Wildlife Fund says Earth has lost two thirds of its wildlife since 1970. You know, vanished as if it's mysterious. We killed them, we killed them. Two thirds of wildlife, but I'm thinking, you know, not at our house, not at our house. I am, I am sure that we have increased biodiversity by at least two thirds, probably more than that. And it didn't take that long and it wasn't that hard. We just put the plants back. It's something we all can do. When we see these, these terrible, frightening headlines, don't give up. We can turn this around. And by we, I mean everybody. But I know what you're thinking. You know, uh, Cindy and I have 10 acres. Will it work on a smaller plot of land in suburbia? That is a good question. So let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. They have 0.6 acres, 18 times less land than Cindy and I have. Uh, and they're in the middle of a development. All their neighbors have the big lawns. Uh, when they moved in there, their yard was choked with bush honeysuckle, armor honeysuckle from Asia, so they got rid of that. Uh, then they put in 75 species of native plants and a little water feature they call a bubbler, and then they sat back and started to count the birds that are using their yard. They are up to 149 bird species, including 35 warbler species. And just to put that in perspective, we've only recorded eight warbler species at, at our house. So does it work on smaller properties? Absolutely. What about urban yards though? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house. I keep saying Pam Carlson, but Pam, Pam and Mike, Mike's in there too. Um, they live in Chicago and they have one tenth of an acre in Chicago. Uh, and, and by in Chicago, I mean in Chicago, that's the uh, tower from the uh, uh, O'Hare airport. Um, the Kennedy Expressway is just over here. Their little one tenth of an acre is not connected to any natural area at all. It's a pretty one tenth of an acre, but they did the same thing. Got rid of uh, their invasive plants, put in 65 species of, of native plants. Water feature for the birds, sat back and started to count the birds using their yard on their little teeny island in the middle of Chicago. 120 bird species have used their yard so far, including a woodcock. There's Pan's woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, go to Pam's house, there it is. Okay, there's four things we need to think about if we're going to succeed, succeed in a big way, and we do want to succeed in a big way. And one of those is we've got to reduce the area in the U.S. that we have allocated to lawn. We've got more than 40 million acres of lawn, and that's a 2005 statistic, so you know it's much more than that at this point. Allocated to an ecological dead space. Now, I know we need lawn to advertise our, our high status, and I know we need lawn to display our, our Halloween decorations. But what if we were to shrink the area of lawn in half? Cut the area, cut that 40 million acres in half. What if we took this, this area and turned it into something like this? This is a picture from uh, Dan Getman in, I think, Missouri sent it to me uh, not long ago, where he's done exactly that. Um, he's, he's, it's a work in progress. But that would give us 20 million acres that we could use for conservation and we could do it right at home. We could grant, uh, build a new national park. I'm calling it Homegrown National Park that will be bigger than the Adirondacks plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains, and up all this park, still less than 20 million acres. So Homegrown National Park would be the biggest park in the country. What do we get when we put a park at home? We get the, the opportunity to develop a personal relationship with Mother Nature. Maybe we had one as a, as a kid and we've lost it and we could re, rebuild that relationship. Maybe we never had one. We could start one from, from scratch. All you have to do is go out, outside. You can do it at your own time, your own pace. You can avoid crowds. 
it's free. There is no no uh, admission fee, uh, and it's never closed, no matter what pandemic comes down the the pike. No travel hassles. All you have to do is go outside to experience the natural world alone, which I think is essential if you're going to build this personal relationship with nature, not mediated by anybody else, just you and Mother Nature. And I know it's essential for our kids who are suffering from nature deficit disorder, according to Richard Liu. Um, so we're trying. We put 30 kids on a bus with a teacher. They drive for an hour, go to a natural area, walk around for an hour. Teacher tells them not to touch anything. And then they get back on the bus and, and then they go home. And that's their experience with the natural world, which is better than nothing, I'm sure. But if they have some part of the natural world at home, all they have to do is go outside and get to know it on their own, alone, no parental supervision. You know, when you supervise your kids, everything it suggests everything out there is dangerous. The natural world is not dangerous. They'll come home, I guarantee it. And they'll have that chance to develop that, that personal relationship, which is so important because they're the future stewards of our planet. If they don't know what they're stewarding, how to steward, if they don't love stewarding the planet, they're gonna be lousy stewards and we don't need any more lousy stewards yet. Maybe they will learn how to hunt lizards. I'm learning this from my own granddaughter, Zoe, who lives in Hawaii on a very uh, modest patch of, of nature, a little piece of lawn with a hedge. But uh, she discovered there were annual lizards there. And she sent me this picture to describe how you hunt lizards. You get in the ground and you cover yourself with leaves and sticks so the lizards don't see you coming. And you crawl very slowly towards the lizard. No smiling. This is serious business. You can wear your best dress. That's okay. But you crawl towards a lizard. You catch the lizard. You put it in an aquarium. And you learn how to take care of it. You learn how to steward that lizard. You develop that personal relationship with that piece of nature. Now, I don't think Zoe's going to be crawling on the ground in her best dress, catching lizards the rest of her life. I don't think. She sent me this picture too. So who knows? But I guarantee she's going to remember catching lizards in Hawaii the rest of her life. And I also guarantee she's going to be a good steward uh, in part because of that experiment. I mean, experience. <laughs> if you want your kids to do more than, than catch lizards, get Nancy Stranisti's Nature Play at Home. Dozens of examples of how to expose kids to the natural, natural world, right where they live. And if you want to join Homegrown Park, Homegrown National Park, you can do that now. Go to our website, homegrownnationalpark.org, and, and join a, a national momentum. We hope it's going viral to, to create that, to restore that 20 million acres of, of lawn. Um, what you do is you, you put in your information of where you live, how much area you're going to uh, put in native plants and remove invasive plants. And your little piece of your county will light up. Uh, we're we're uh, building this map so that you can you can click on it and see all the areas that have lit up so far, and we can watch this this uh, national effort spread across the country. It's free, and no, we're not using your data. I don't even know what that means. Um, okay, so we're going to shrink the lawn. Uh, what plants are we going to put in the area that that was lawn? Well, some of them have to be what I'm calling keystone plants. Remember what a keystone is. This is the Roman arch. A keystone is the stone in the middle of the arch. If you take that stone out, the arch falls apart. If you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web falls apart because they're making most of the food. Just 5% of our, our local, uh, or 5% of the, uh, the native plants near you are making 75% of the caterpillar food that drives the, the food webs. 14 excuse me, 14% of, of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. So think of the keystone plants in your, your area as the two by fours that are holding up the ecological house that you're, you're building in your yard. They're essential. Your house is not going to stand up without them. You cannot build a house out of wallpaper. You're not finished building your house when you have your keystone plants, but they're an essential component of it. So the question is no longer simply, are natives better than non-natives ecologically? You know, on average, they certainly are, but there's a lot of native plants that aren't producing all that much food either. So the question really is, you know, do we want to use the native species that are supporting the most pollinators and the most caterpillars or not? I get an email once in a while from somebody saying, don't you know that ginkgos, ginkgo biloba from Asia actually grew in North America seven million years ago. That makes them native. That means we can plant them and everything will be great. Yes, I do know that 
ginkgos grew in, in North America 7 million years ago. We can argue about whether that makes them native today, but I'm not going to have that argument because that's not the metric anymore. It's not whether they're native or not. It's whether they're doing anything or not. I don't care if ginkgos grew in the moon 7 million years ago. Here today, they're producing zero species of caterpillars. They are not fueling the food web. They're taking up space. What is providing the most food for our food webs is, is one of the oaks. Um, they're the most powerful keystone plant in 84% of the counties in North America. They produce 557 species of caterpillars just in the mid-Atlantic states and over 950 nationwide. There's no other plant genus that comes close to that. So if you want to know what the keystone species are where you live, go to uh, uh, um, National Wildlife Federation's Native Plant Finder and put in your zip code and the rank list of, of both uh, woody plants and herbaceous plants for your county will pop up. Um, so uh, this is just examples of types of lists that, that pop up. Notice I say native oaks, native cherries, native willows. If I go to the nursery and say, I want to buy a cherry, Undoubtedly, they will sell me an ornamental cherry from Asia. If I say I want to buy a willow, they're going to send me a weeping willow from Turkey. Um, even if I buy, want to buy an oak, they might sell me a, a uh, sawtooth oak from China. You've got to specify that you want a native member of these very powerful genera. Because if you don't get a native member, it's going to reduce caterpillar use by 68%. We have done that experiment. These are the most powerful uh, herbaceous plants in uh, most of the counties, particularly in the, the Northeast. Goldenrods usually lead the list, followed by the various genera the asters were broken up into. Sunflower is very high. Uh, with just those three groups of, of genera right there, um, not only will you produce a lot of caterpillars, goldenrods support 110 species of caterpillars, but you'll also support the most specialist bees. When we're making a pollinator garden, we wanna support the specialist bees because the generalist bees can use those plants as well. If you plant only for the generalist, the things like bumblebees and honeybees, uh, you lose the, the specialist native bees. So with solidago, asters, and, and helianthus, you can get over 44 species of specialist bees. Uh, and if you don't have them in your yard, you won't have those species. So we're gonna shrink the loam, we're gonna use keystone plants, we're gonna attract a lot of insects to our yard, then we're going to kill them with our security light. And that of course is not the goal. A lot of research is showing that light pollution uh, is, is one of the major causes of insect declines, uh, it, particularly in the temperate zone. These are all the ways that lights are killing our, our insects. But to me, this is actually good news. We have to reverse insect decline. We've lost 45% of the insects on planet Earth already. Um, and remember that the little things keeping us, keeping us alive. We've got to turn that around. And if we can do that by simply flicking a switch, turning our lights out at night, we're getting off easy. But I know what you're going to say. I can't turn my garage light out overnight because uh, if I do, the bad man will come. Okay. Put a motion sensor on it so that it will only light up when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're going to see is the bad man doesn't come very often. And if you don't want to do that, take the white bulb out of your, your security light and put in a yellow bulb. Yellow LED is the best. Um, not only are you using just a little bit of energy, but yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to nocturnal insects. If we switch out our light white lights for yellow lights overnight, we'll save millions of insects and also millions of dollars because again, they're a lot more energy efficient. So we're gonna shrink the lawn, we're gonna use keystone plants, we're gonna turn out our lights, and then we're gonna invite Mosquito Joe to come kill all of our insects. Booming business all around the country. Mosquito Joe is undoing everything I've been talking about for the last 15 years. But he'll say, well, it's okay because that's a natural product. And he's right, it's a natural product. It's pyrethroids, the, the, the compounds that are in chrysanthemums, um, but you know, cyanide is a natural product too. So, so that's not a good argument. He'll also say it only kills mosquitoes. And boy, I wish he was right. Uh, but in fact, he kills all the insects it comes in contact with, including monarchs, by the way, uh, not this fall, but last fall, there are big headlines about huge monarch kills during migration. They flew through Mosquito Joe, hundreds of dead monarchs on the ground. Big thing is though, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. You don't control mosquitoes in the adult stage. You control them in the larval stage. 
In order to control mosquitoes in the adult stage, you have to kill 90% of the adults. Mosquito gel kills between 10 and 50% of the adults. So it's not even close to working. That's why he has to keep coming back and spraying again and again and again and charging you each time. If you really want to control mosquitoes, get a bucket. People say, how big a bucket? I don't care. Get a bucket, fill it full of water, put in a handful of, of straw or hay and let it ferment for a couple of days. This is in the warm part of the, of the year. You're building up populations of diatoms and algae, and that is what mosquito larvae eat. Uh, then the adult female mosquitoes that want to lay their eggs will lay their eggs in your bucket. It's an irresistible brew for them. And once they do that, you go to the hardware store and buy mosquito dunks. Put in one of these dunks that is Bacillus thuringiensis, a natural bacterium that only kills aquatic diptera. And the only aquatic dipterin in your bucket is a mosquito, a mosquito larvae. So you put that in, the mosquito larvae chew on it, and that's the end of the mosquito larvae. Very targeted. If a dragonfly gets in there, it won't hurt it at all. If a bird drinks it or your, excuse me, if your dog licks it, no problem. You might put a screen, coarse screen over that. So chipmunks don't jump in and, and drown. Uh, but otherwise it's a targeted cheap way to control mosquitoes, particularly if everybody did it. All right, the fourth thing we need to do is to landscape in a way that uh, allows caterpillars to complete their development. What do I mean by that? Well, this is an example. In, in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where I live, uh, oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, uh, complete their development on the tree. So the caterpillar chews the leaves, uh, then it, it completes it, its growth and spins a cocoon and hangs from one of the branches. Then it emerges as an adult. Then it does it all again. Everything happens on the tree. And I wish that happened for all the species. But um, most species don't do that. 94% of them finish growing as caterpillars, but then they drop from the tree and they wiggle their way underneath the ground and, and form a pupa underground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree. We don't tolerate it. We, we rake it all up. We mow and compact the soil so it's too hard for, for caterpillars to, to tunnel in there. We create ecological traps. We're calling in uh, adult moths that lay their eggs. Caterpillars develop, drop down, and die. And I am, I am convinced this is another um, very important cause of insect declines. Uh, wherever we landscape like this, which is pretty much everywhere. And of course, the cement landscape is even less of a viable option. This is what most people do. They have a tree in a yard, and we're just starting to measure how well caterpillars do in a situation like this, but I guarantee they're going to do better in a situation like this. We have a tree, then you have a layered landscape, maybe a dogwood here and a native azalea and ferns and ground cover. This becomes a safe site. Caterpillar can drop down, easily get beneath the surface of the soil because it's not compacted. Nobody's going to step on it. Nobody's going to mow it. It's spinning a cocoon, the leaf litter that's down there. Wonderful situation for caterpillars, and it's beautiful. Um, so we're not asking you to, to give up gardening. I'm asking you to increase it. Put beds around all of your trees. This is where you can do your spring ephemeral gardening. Again, safe site, and your tree will love it, by the way. Trees do not like grass. goes right up to them. It's a good place to use ground covers like wild ginger or, or uh, may apples or foam flower and, and again, ferns. This is a hotel in Athens, Georgia. These are red maple trees. Any caterpillars developing on the red maple trees can drop down and complete the development, even though this is the middle of a city because of this fern ground cover. We could do a whole lot better the way uh, in terms of caterpillar uh, development if we landscape properly under our trees. Another grad student, former grad student, Desiree Narango, um, has done some wonderful work with chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, DC. And her results suggest that there's actually room for compromise in our plant choices. And that's good news. What she did was, was ask a simple question. How well do, do suburban landscapes that are landscaped primarily with native plants, none of her landscapes were 100% native, but primarily with native plants, how well do they support chickadee populations over, over time? compared to landscapes that are dominated by introduced plants. And the first thing she found is that when they're dominated by introduced plants, they produce, those landscapes produce 75% fewer caterpillars, 75% less bird food. They were 60% less likely to have breeding birds at all. 
even though there's nest boxes up in every landscape, the chickadees would come and look around and say, there's not enough food here. We're not even gonna try to reproduce. If they did try to reproduce, they laid 1.5 fewer eggs. Those clutches were 29% less likely to survive at all. Those nests produced 1.2 fewer fledglings. If they did survive, and it took them 1.5 days longer to do that. And you might say, ah, those aren't huge differences, but you put all that into a population growth model as a function of the percentage of non-native woody plants in the landscape. We look at woody plants because that's where chickadees forage on woody plants. This is what you get. Uh, this spot, dotted line here is replacement rate. That's the rate at which the population has to make babies in order to replace the adults that die every year. Chickadees don't live very long. If you reproduce at this rate, that is a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, you have a growing population. But if you make fewer babies, you've got a shrinking, unsustainable population. This is the uh, area, generously speaking, where those lines overlap, which suggests you can have up to 30% of the woody plant biomass in your yard, non-native, without destroying the local food web. They can't have invasive plants in here. No, no burning bush, no, no barberry, no calorie pear, uh, because those are ecological tumors. They just keep growing and growing and, and destroying all kinds of things. But you know, your forsythia, the ginkgo, um, boxwoods, a lot of things that we put in our yards are not invasive, even though they're, they're non-native. Um, so it, this is the area of compromise I'm talking about. If my message was you can't have any non-natives at all, very few people would be listening to that. Here's our friend Dan, Dan Getman again. This is a ginkgo tree. Why is it there? His wife wanted it there. She loves ginkgo. She insisted on having a ginkgo. Is it destroying all of this landscape? No, it's not. It's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It's the absence of native plants. If we get more native plants into our landscape, we can tolerate some, some non-natives. Can we use natives uh, in formal designs? Of course we can. This is a Lynn O'Shaughnessy design. You don't get more formal than that. Uh, this is taken from a drone 400 feet up. It's a large garden, but every plant in that garden is a native plant. So formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in, in Europe every day. I guess it's okay because they're non-native plants over there. Can we get a pollinator garden into a, a traditional uh, or typical suburban yard like this without offending anybody? Of course we can. Put a little fence around it. It formalizes it. It tells everybody that this is on purpose, that you didn't just miss a patch of weeds with the mower. It's meeting the needs of a number of species of bees. It's beautiful when it's in bloom. Not very big, could be bigger, but if everybody did it, it would help a lot. And remember why we need pollinators. You hear all the time, you need them because they're pollinating a third of our crops. It's really about a 12th of our crops. Uh, but then people say, well, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any pollinators. Yes, you do, because it's, forget the crops. They pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. Where do we need pollinators? Every place we need plants. If we don't have pollinators, we lost 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet, and that's not an, an option. What about this, a Drew Latham design, much bigger. Imagine the amount of life here versus the amount of life here. Seems like a no brainer to me. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Yes, and more and more of them are doing it. Minnesota is a cost-sharing plan, which encourages homeowners to replace lawn uh, with, with uh, appropriate Minnesota prairie plants. It's called the Lawn to Legume Program, very popular. State helps you do that, helps you pay for it. Pennsylvania's got a new lawn conversion program. Get up to $5,000 per acre to convert your, your lawn into uh, native plantings. It was designed to help watersheds uh, but this is a good example of how you can do more than one thing at a time. If you use native plants, you can help the watershed and biodiversity at the same time. Island off of Florida is paying residents to allow burrowing owls, listed species, to burrow in the front yard. This is the way the, the Endangered Species Act should have been written, with carrots rather than sticks. Rather than find somebody because they've got an, an endangered species on their property, pay them to take care of it. Everybody would want an endangered species on their property. Missouri, Fayetteville, Arkansas, and I think I heard North Carolina or South Carolina have a, a, a bounty on calorie pears. Take, take a calorie pear out of your yard and you get a free tree replacement. 
and even water utilities are getting into the act. In San Antonio, uh, you get $100 coupons if you put in water efficient native plants uh, and, and get rid of those thirsty non-native plants. And of course, the big um, long conversion rebates in California. Uh, this says two dollars per square foot uh, uh, if for every square foot of lawn you take out. That's actually now up to three dollars for every square foot of lawn you take out. California does not have one drop of rain that it can allocate to to cool season European grasses. You put in appropriate xeric plantings, and all will be well. I think we made three missteps in the early years of conservation, and the first one's important. We've come to think of nature as optional. As, as if it's not essential. We like it, but you know, if it's optional, then when push comes to shove, when resources are in short supply, which is always, nature takes a back seat. Went to the Cincinnati Zoo uh, before the virus broke out and there's this wall size poster there, which to me epitomizes our society's view of conservation. Uh, we wanna save wildlife, we wanna save nature for future generations to enjoy. It was Teddy Roosevelt's argument for creating the national park system. You wanna save these beautiful places because they're gorgeous and we want future generations to appreciate them. And I understand that, but it suggests nature's there just for entertainment. No wonder we think it's optional. Entertainment is optional, but nature's not optional. We need to save nature, not, not to make us happy in the future, but so that we have future generations. It's a little bit more urgent. And we've also uh, assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist together. And we talked about this. If we restrict conservation just to areas where we don't have a lot of humans, we're gonna fail because those areas are too small, too few, and too isolated from each other. David Quammen has a, a wonderful uh, analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. This is a Persian rug. That is not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are, are acting like a Persian rug. And that is what we have done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. Uh, and I, I hate that language because it suggests there are places on planet earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the earth has ecological significance, including our yards including our roadsides, including our corporate landscapes, even including much of our, our agriculture. So we need to glue our rug back together again, folks. We need to put the plants back, not just to build biological carters that allow plants and animals to move back and forth between uh, viable habitats, but to build viable habitats where we've destroyed them. When we put the plants back, it'll be the first time in modern history that we humans are going to coexist with nature. Our third misstep was to leave earth stewardship to just a few specialists, a few conservation biologists, few ecologists. For some reason, we didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of everybody on the planet. But I don't know why, because everybody on the planet depends entirely on the quality of earth's ecosystem. So why wouldn't everybody on the planet, want, why wouldn't every single person bear the responsibility for good earth stewardship? Stan Rushworth, a Cherokee elder, once said, the Western settler mindset was, I have rights. Mindset of indigenous people is, I have obligations. You're not born with these mindsets, you're taught them. And we're very good at teaching this one. We've been terrible at teaching our kids and our peers that we all have obligations to good earth stewardship. It doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. The earth has huge problems today. And most people feel absolutely powerless. What can one person do to combat these, these problems? Well, one person can shrink the lawn. One person can turn out their lights. One person can use keystone plants. One person can put in a pollinator garden. One person can get rid of their invasive plants on their property. We didn't even talk about that one. One person can totally revitalize the ecosystem function where they live and enhance their local ecosystem instead of degrade it. And it also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. You'll get depressed. Just worry about the piece of the planet that you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where, that's where you start. That's where you can see immediate results. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a park or a preserve, help a land conservancy. They're all underfunded, they're all understaffed, they will love you as a volunteer. So as property owners or volunteers, each one of us has the power 
We certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is going to determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own fate. I think I've convinced my grandchildren that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much.